given three verses. John 17, 17, John 14, 6, 1 John 5, 6. I could have added Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, which says God is a God of truth. I have done that for this reason. I will not preach a sermon this evening. I will try to answer some questions that were sent on the internet. I feel led by God to do this. So our title is Questions and Answers. Every night I ask you to pray for me that the Lord will put his words in my mouth. I'm not quite sure, I'm not sure at all to what degree you accept this request as serious. But I'm asking you tonight, wherever you are, ask God to put his words in my mouth as I try to explain some issues brought to my attention by those who listen and God bless them wherever they are. So I will be answering some questions. I'm sure it will take up all the time. I did have a message prepared, but when my good brother sent me a couple of questions, I felt convicted to deal with that instead of adding a layer of knowledge. You see, if your foundation is not secure, whatever you put on top of it will collapse. And so that's why I've decided to entitle this presentation, Questions and Answers, and I believe you will be blessed as the Holy Spirit leads me in answering these questions. Before I go any further, remember always, now this time this is on because I have to read the question that was sent. So mine is on, but the volume is down. So if you're using a phone, please make sure it does not ring in the presence of God. Favor number two, here it comes. While I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I need that help because I'm human, I'm flesh, I am dirt, I am clay, I am all of these things combined and multiplied. And so I need the fulfillment of the words of Christ. In John 16 verse 13, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And I need that right now. So ask God to put his words in my mouth. My text for that, Jeremiah 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as always, favor number three, think. Isaiah 1 18, come now, let us reason together. And as I go through this presentation, you will see the necessity of reasoning. It is essential to reason when studying the Bible. Because the Bible is not a book mainly of proof. It is a book of evidence. Where there is proof, you don't need faith. Where there is evidence, you need faith to follow in the direction in which the evidence points. This even goes on in secular courtrooms. Cases are decided on the basis of evidence, seldom absolute proof. When we reason honestly, the Spirit of God will guide our minds in the path of truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the gift of life. Thank you, dear God, for the precious promises in your word. One of those promises you made to Moses, but I need them. Moses doesn't need that now. Exodus 4.12, you said to him, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Fulfill that promise for me, dear God, as I humble myself before you. My desire is to present, Thus saith the Lord, Grant me your spirit, dear God, to enable me to do this to a degree that glorifies your name and clarifies the issues for those who desire truth. I ask you to bless everyone listening to God. I always pray for all the countries represented by this audience, wherever they are, however far flung, your mercy and your grace can reach them. Touch each person individually. I ask you to Pour out a special blessing on the visitors, dear God. Those who are not Seventh-day Adventists, bless them in a very signal way and a special double blessing on their children. Bless the leaders of the countries, dear God. This COVID-19 has created catastrophe in certain countries more than in others. 
pour out your mercy according to God to the condition in which people find themselves because you're a God of mercy. Now, Father, I lay myself in your hands. Use me as a mouthpiece for the truth. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. The questions arose from last night's presentation where I was perhaps fairly forceful and calling upon people who keep Sunday to stop if they do ignoringly, willfully, deliberately, intentionally, flagrantly keeping a day that God did not sanctify. And I believe it was that that led to the question. Let me turn to question one and uh, read it as best I understand it. Let me get out two extra eyes and read this. Here's what the person said. In his own words, Jesus made it clear that the laws of Moses and of the prophet were valid until the time of John the Baptist. Now we'll go to Luke 16, 16. The person said, Jesus in his own words made it clear that the laws of Moses and the prophets were valid up to John the Baptist, meaning they cease to have any validity at John. They stopped. They were useless. They were, not, they were obsolete. Is this what Jesus is saying? Let us go to Luke 16, verse 16. Our subject, questions and answers. Luke 16, reading verse 16. Listen to the question again. Jesus, no, it says, in his own words, and the person is referring to Luke 16, 16, Jesus made it clear that the laws of Moses and of the prophets were valid until the time of John the Baptist, meaning they lost validity and meaning they became obsolete with the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. All right. Here is what Luke 16, 16 says. The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Listen again. The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. The writer of the question is taking that expression to mean that the law and the prophets ended at John the Baptist. I checked 26 Bible versions. Not one of them says that. Because that's not what the text is saying. The law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Since that time, since John the Baptist began his ministry, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Go to Matthew 3. Let's see what presseth into it means. Matthew 3, we'll read from verse 5. This is about John the Baptist and his ministry. Matthew 3, verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. They were coming to John in droves because the message John was preaching they had never heard. And so when Jesus says in, John, in Luke 16, 16, and every man presseth into it, they were coming, the Bible says, all of Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region round about Jordan came to John and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. There was a, a preaching of repentance. The kingdom of God is at hand, which is what John was preaching, which is what Jesus preached. Because John prepared the way for Jesus. So when Jesus says, since that time, Luke 16, 16, the kingdom of God is preached. In other words, from the preaching of John, people have been coming to be baptized. They've heard of this new doctrine. It wasn't new. It was just that the Jews misinterpreted the Old Testament. Let me explain. 
by asking you this question and those of you listening when Christ was born did the Jewish nation know he had come yes or no no now was Christ prophesied all through the Old Testament yes they didn't know because the law and the prophets and the Psalms, which is a word for the writings, talked about Jesus. But because they studied the scriptures looking for an earthly Messiah, the mindset you bring to the Bible is essential to understand what the Bible is saying. They were looking for someone who would deliver them from successive oppression. First the Babylonians, well even before the Babylonians, the Assyrians had conquered the northern kingdom in 721, 722 BC. The southern kingdom fell in about 586. So we have the Assyrians, we have the Babylonians, we have the Medes and the Persians, we have the Greeks, then we have the Romans, and all these powers over the Jews. They are looking for someone who is an earthly deliverer. When Jesus came as a deliverer from sin, they didn't know because they misunderstood the Bible because they brought to it the wrong mindset. Now, the only people who knew were three wise men from hundreds of miles away because they studied correctly and the shepherds who were told after Jesus was born. I say again, an entire nation studying the law and the prophets but studying badly did not know so jesus says the law and the prophets were until john this was your source of information this is what was proclaimed to you this is what you relied on for your knowledge of god but now the kingdom of god is preached by the same john another point to bear in mind the writer of the question said jesus in his own words declared the laws of Moses and the prophets to be extinct and no longer valid. The Bible does not say the laws. It just says the law, and that's significant. You read any Bible version of Luke 16, 16. It does not say the laws and the prophet were until John the Baptist. It says the law. Now, why is that significant? In the Bible, the expression the law and the prophets of the law of Moses and the prophets refer to different sections of the Old Testament. Let me explain. Let me pray first. Father, be with me. Restrain my human nature. Let only your spirit have his way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before I explain the law and the prophets and the law of Moses, let's read verse 16 again in the light of what the person wrote. And I must read what the person wrote again. Listen, I must read it. I need to be fair. The person says, in his own words, referring to Luke 16, 16, Jesus made it clear that the laws of Moses and of the prophets were valid until the time of John the Baptist, which means they ceased to be valid with the coming of John the Baptist now. Listen to 16, then we'll go to 17. The law... And the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Listen to verse 17. Listen carefully. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. The same law, the person says, was made invalid in verse 16. Jesus says in verse 17, heaven and earth will pass before one tittle of the law passes. Now, how do you explain that? Because you cannot build a theology on one verse. Are you following me? Listen again. The person said Jesus made it clear that the law and the prophets were invalid. When John came, Jesus said in verse 17, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass, which means as long as there's a heaven and there's an earth, the law of God is valid. Somebody say amen. Now, I was talking about the law, the law of Moses, the law and the prophets. Sometimes the Bible says the law of Moses. Sometimes it just says the law. Sometimes it just says Moses. 
Let's go to Luke 24. Let me show you what I mean. We will reason from scripture to scripture and let me remind you, please pray for me and ask God to put his words in my mouth. I believe there are people listening all over the world and I want to make sure their minds are guided into the path of truth. What book did I say? What book did I say? What chapter? 24. What verse? 27. Luke 24, 27. Let me set it up. You know the story of Christ talking to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Christ had risen from the dead. The disciples did not believe it. These two disciples are walking and they're depressed. Jesus appears to them. What are you talking about? And they tell him in verse 21, but we had trusted that it had been him. We should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, this is now the third day since all this began. All this happened. They're just telling this sad story and uh, we're depressed. He did not deliver Israel. They have the same mindset as the Old Testament people who did not believe that Christ was coming. They did not study the Bible properly. Now. Jesus said to them in verse 25, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was not Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? What do you mean by suffer these things? The crucifixion. The point on the discussion is the crucifixion and the resurrection. Let me say that again. Particularly the resurrection did, did not believe he had risen. The point on the discussion Christ is trying to clarify is that the Bible said, I will rise. And so Jesus says, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He could not enter the glory if he had stayed dead. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, which is the Old Testament, the things concerning himself. Listen again. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. So all the scriptures must include all the writings of Moses. Even though just the word Moses is used. Now, let's go to verse 44 of that same chapter. It is the same discussion, but this time to more of the disciples, not just the two. Luke 24, verse 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things should be fulfilled which were written in what? The law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Now, in verse 27, he began where? At Moses. In verse 44, it says, The law of Moses. It's the same thing. He simply said Moses because the Jews understood when he said Moses, he meant the writings of Moses. Now in verse 44, he says the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. The Old Testament, as I said earlier, was divided into the law of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then the prophets, Joshua to Malachi, and within that group you had historical prophets, you had the earlier prophets and the latter prophets. Then the Psalms was used to refer to the, 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 the holy writings. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Sons of Solomon, Ruth, Esther, Lamentations, they were all the holy writings, but the most popular was the Psalms. And so the word Psalms is used just to identify all the holy writings. Jesus, the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, or the holy writings. In verse 27, he just says Moses. In verse 44, he says the law of Moses. So sometimes the law of Moses can be referred to simply as Moses or simply the law as in the case of Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets, which should be the law of Moses and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Now, let's take a look at the law of Moses and see what the Bible means. Let me slow down a little, give you time to digest what you're hearing. We're looking at the law of Moses. Let's reason together. Let us go to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9. Now, let me go back to the person's question. The person is assuming that the word law in Luke 16, 16 refers to the Ten Commandments. Because I was preaching on the Sabbath. 
and I was fairly forceful. You ought to keep the Sabbath. Clearly, this person is saying the law of God, the Ten Commandments, ceased with John the Baptist. All right. We are now at 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9. The Bible says, For it is written in the law of Moses, what? You tell me. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Read microscopically. Look at how the verse begins. For it is written in the law of Moses. Now, if the law of Moses refers to the Ten Commandments, you tell me which of the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Which one? Not one. Clearly, this expression, the law of Moses, refers to the five books because the, the saying, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, is found in Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Paul says it is written in the law of Moses, then Deuteronomy must be a part of the law of Moses. Ah, did I lose you? Repetition is an effective tool of teaching. Let me repeat. Let me pray again. Father, please God, don't leave me in the pulpit struggling. Speak through me literally, dear Father. I humble myself before you. Literally speak through me as I deal with this most important subject. Because it was the violation of the law that led to the death of your son. Hear me, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's try another example. Go to John 8. Let's go to John 8. It's 20 after 7. John 8. We're looking at the law of Moses. Does that term refer to the Ten Commandments? And we have to reason honestly. You have John 8. In this story, in this chapter, we have the story of the woman taken in adultery. Verse 4 says, And when they said in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in, in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned, but what says thou? Now listen again, Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. Now if the law refers to the Ten Commandments, you tell me which of the Ten Commandments contains the punishment for adultery. None of them. But John, the closest disciple to Jesus Christ, he says, he reports, Moses in the law wrote or said that such should be stoned. You know where that's found? Leviticus 20 verse 10, Deuteronomy 22 verses 21 to 24, which means Leviticus is part of the law of Moses. Do we have Deuteronomy? We have Leviticus. They are both part of the law of Moses because the law of Moses does the Ten Commandments do not express the punishment for adultery the Ten Commandments do not state that thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn yet the Bible says the law of Moses said these things let's go back to Luke 24 where the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the issue under discussion. The disciples did not believe it, and Christ is trying to show them that the entire Old Testament predicted these things. Now, listen to verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled that are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me meaning his resurrection. But where in the Ten Commandments is the resurrection of Jesus mentioned? So the law of Moses cannot be the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments do not speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to tell you, when you see the law of Moses, you cannot automatically assume the Bible is referring to the Ten Commandments. You've got to study the context of that passage. And we've seen 1 Corinthians 9.9. 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's found in Deuteronomy 24 verse 5. That's the law of Moses. Now, let's go to uh, John 5. John 5, we're trying to answer questions. John 5, and I'm taking a lot of time on this because the issue with people is the law of God. 
the law of God. And there's a reason for that. But it's not a pleasant reason. But it's biblical, and I may have to tell you. John 5. I know you that ye have... Uh, verse 42. But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. I am coming my own name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his name, him ye will receive. How can he believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is another who accuses you, even Moses in whom ye trust. What does he mean by Moses will accuse them? Moses does not accuse people. Christ is referring to the writings of Moses. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. Last verse, I think it's verse 47. But if he believe not his what? Come on. If he believe not his what? His writings, how can he believe my words? Now, let's look at the writings of Moses by looking at the writings of God. Go to Deut uh, not Deuteronomy, Exodus 32. We'll read verse 15 and verse 16. Our subject, questions and answers. Deuteronomy 32, 15 and 16. And may the good God of heaven put his words in my mouth. I want everybody saved. No one can be saved in disobedience. Absolutely not. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other side were they written. And the tables, verse 16, were what? The work of God, keep reading. And the writing, come on was the writing of God. The Ten Commandments were not written by Moses. They were written by God twice. So when Jesus said in verse 47 of John 5, but if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? It is not the Ten Commandments. It's a reference to the first five books of the Bible, which are called the books of Moses because he wrote them. The writings of Moses do not include the Ten Commandments. They are within his writings, but they were written by God. Moses might have copied them, but they are originally written by God. Let's go to Exodus 31. Let's read verse 18 as we identify the writings of Moses by identifying the writings of God. Exodus 31, verse 18, our subject, questions and answers. Book number two of Exodus, verse, chapter 31, verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, you finish the verse, written with the finger of God. The Ten Commandments were not written by Moses. They were written by God. And so the writings of Moses cannot strictly include the Ten Commandments. Even though they're found within the first five books, they were written by God. When the Bible talks about, if he believe not his writings, how shall he believe my words? Christ is referring to the first five books of the Bible. Let's go back to Luke 16, verse 16. And let me reread the person's question. And I hope many of my friends online have told God, put your words in that man's mouth. Listen again. In his own words, this is very emphatic, Jesus made it clear that the laws of Moses, and the Bible doesn't say the laws of Moses, it just says the law, and of the prophets, were valid until the time of John the Baptist. Now, since this person is targeting the Ten Commandments, if the Ten Commandments cease to be valid, the law, at John the Baptist, does that include thou shalt not kill? Does that include thou shalt not steal? Is thou shalt not kill still valid? The answer is yes. And no person in control of his senses will argue that. Thou shalt not commit adultery is still valid. No person will argue that. What people will argue is remember the Sabbath day. To get rid of that, they make an attempt to get rid of the whole law. 
Now the person says, someone else I think, I believe it's someone else, I'm not sure. Here's what someone writes. Maybe the same person I don't know. Could be. Listen to this. Father, as I read this question, be with me, God, and tell me how to answer your people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen carefully. There is a teaching that states that the Sabbath is God's mark of ownership on his people. But that is not biblical at all. <laughs> okay. Let's go to <laughs> Ezekiel 20. Let's read verse 12. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. The person said, there's a teaching that the Sabbath is God's mark of ownership on his people, but that is not biblical at all. Okay. Yeah, Ezekiel 20 verse 12. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be what? A sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord to sanctify them. I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign. The same thing is found in Exodus 31, 13 in, Ex in Ezekiel 20, verse 20. So when the person says it is not biblical, this is not strictly true. The Sab now the person says, God cannot identify his people with part of a law, and he calls it Moses' law, whose operation and ability to bring righteousness out of the Israelites on which it was based, I guess, failed and was declared null and void and obsolete. And the person gives Deuteronomy 8, 10 to 13 as the verse or the passage that shows that the law of God is null, void, and obsolete. And he calls the Ten Commandments the law of Moses. All right. Because the issue circled around my insistence on the seventh day Sabbath. So we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Hebrews 8. Let's look at 10 to 13. We continue with questions and answers. For this, this is Ezek uh, Hebrews 8 from verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws where? Where? In their heart, uh -huh, and write them where? In the inward parts. Now, listen to the words again. The person is giving me this passage as proof that the laws of God are obsolete. What is the words used? Obsolete, null, and declared null, void, and obsolete. Listen to what the passage says. Verse 10. For this is the covenant. The person is referring to this new covenant, okay, which is true which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Here it comes. I will do what? Put my laws where? And do what? Yes, I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. Now, if the law is null and void and obsolete, what does God write? He said, he predicted that in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law in the inward parts and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. In the new covenant. You see, the old covenant. Let me, we have the old covenant and the new. Here's a mistake many of us make. We view the old covenant as a matter of historical time. And the new covenant, also as a matter of historical time. The old covenant is not so much a matter of time. It is a matter of attitude towards God or God's law. The new covenant is also an attitude towards God's law. Under the old covenant, the Jews said, all that the Lord has spoken, the Israelite, we will do. Now this is self-righteousness. All that the Lord has spoken. This is not an Old Testament problem. This is a modern problem. There are people who feel they're righteous. And I can be righteous by doing this and that and that. Not realizing Christ has to make you righteous. And so the old covenant is not so much a matter of time. It is a matter of attitude towards God's law and God's righteousness and God himself. When Moses told the people what God said, they said, all that the Lord has spoken. We, we've got this covered. As we say in the United States, we got this. We'll do it. And then they were worshiping an image in chapter 32. The new covenant is, Lord, 
write your law on my heart. That's the new covenant. That's how Abraham was saved. That's how Adam was saved. There are two approaches to God. Trusting God or trusting self. Trusting self is the old covenant. Trusting God is the new. You see, there are two ways to be saved. From Adam until now, every saved person has been saved the same way. Through faith in Christ, who writes the law on our hearts. And so when the person says, the new covenant made the law null and void and obsolete, then tell me, what does God write on the heart and the mind of a person, which is what he's supposed to do under the new covenant? Hebrews 8 verse 10. It also found in Hebrews 10 verse 16, Jeremiah 31 verse 33. What does he write? Let me get to a... Listen to this. Um, okay, where are we? Here we are. Another question. Many are struggling with the question of the Holy Spirit as the seal and the Sabbath as the seal. Which is the seal? Both. Let me ask you this. Jesus said what? If you love me, come on. That's what he said. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you say to me, I love Jesus, how am I supposed to know that? When Jesus condemns just words, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. If you say, I love Jesus, I ought to see it in the way you live, right or wrong. Now, go to Galatians 5. Let's read from verse 19. And reason through the scriptures. It's 25 to 8. Galatians 5, verse 19. God bless those of you online praying for me. Wherever you are, God bless you. I see you by faith. You have Galatians 5, verse 19. Father in heaven, continue to tell me exactly what to do that your word may be represented aright, your truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. What do you understand by manifest? They're obvious. They can be seen. The works of the flesh, meaning an unconverted person, the sinner, are manifest. You see them, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Paul is saying, these are the evidence that the person is still in the flesh. You see, the flesh is an inward condition. All we just listed are outward behaviors. Now, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, now, where do you see the fruit? On the outside of a tree or the inside? The outside. But the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, the same way I know that person is flesh, by these behaviors, I know this person is a spirit person. By these fruits, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now, the Bible goes on to say at the end of verse 23 of Galatians 5, against such, there's no law. Now, is there a law against 19 to 21? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, listen. Yes, but if the law was made obsolete by the new covenant, then there is no adultery, there is no fornication, there is no uncleanness, there is no lasciviousness, there is no variance, emulations, wrath, no strife, seditions, heresies, no idolatry, no witchcraft, no hatred. Why? Because the law has been made dull, null and void and obsolete. Because it is the law that points out sin. This is evidence you're in the flesh. This is evidence you're in the spirit. Now, look at the fruits of the spirit a little more closely. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Let's look at faith. Now, there are two kinds of faith. Well, there are really just one, but I'll say two. One is living faith. What's the other one? 
If one is a living faith, what's the other one? A dead faith. All right. Go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Read verse 26. James chapter 2, verse 26. Are you there? Not yet. All right. It's 21 minutes to 8. You have James 2, verse 26. The Bible says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The faith the spirit gives as a fruit of the spirit is a faith that produces works. Are you with me? No spirit of God will give you a dead faith because he is the spirit of life. Romans 8 from verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Verse 2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The spirit gives life. If the Spirit gives faith, it is a living faith, and a faith is only alive if it is evidenced by works. And so when we have the fruit of the Spirit called faith, it is demonstrated, and that demonstration that works is obedience to the law of God. I'll tell you something else. The person says the Spirit, who is the seal of the Spirit or the, or the Sabbath, and I'll get into that a little more. Go to Acts 5.32. Acts 5, 32. We're coming to the end of questions and answers. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. This is that Peter and John and the disciples speaking. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that do what? Obey him. Now, if the law has been made dull and void to them that obey what? If the new covenant has made the law null and void and obsolete, Christ has gone back. He died. He rose. He has validated the new covenant. He's in heaven now. One of his disciples filled with the Holy Ghost says, the spirit is given to those who obey. Obey what? The Spirit is a seal that's internal. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Romans 8 verse 9. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. The presence of the Spirit of God in a person identifies that person as a child of God. But that's internal. You don't know who's filled with the Spirit unless by external behavior. I don't mean the spirit where you run around the church and you fall down and you faint. No, no, no. That's a different spirit. Sabbath keeping is an external seal because it is manifested in your behavior. You don't work. You don't do certain things on a holy day as the Bible requires. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. You, you actually, you have a whole day to prepare and then the holy day comes. Everything about you changes and people notice that's an outward seal. The spirit in you leads you to exercise that outward seal. So we have internal and we have external. In the Old Testament, there were two seals. One was circumcision. There are men sitting around here, you don't know who's circumcised. That's internal. That's hidden. But there was also the Sabbath as a sign. So there were two. The Sabbath, circumcision. One was private. One was public. Because faith must have works. Are you with me? And so if you say I'm filled with the Spirit, show me. And you show it by a life of obedience to God. Now, if the New Testament has made the law of God null, void, and obsolete, there is no judgment. Why do I say that? Go to James chapter 2. James was written about 20 to 30 years after Jesus went back. This is the half-brother of Christ. The book of James was written between 20 and 30 years after Christ went back to heaven, after he validated the new covenant. Here's what the brother of Jesus says. 
James 2 verse 8, I'll pray, Father, I'm coming to the end, but continue to speak through me, please, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Now, James identifies. For he that said, verse 11, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. From where is James quoting? The Ten Commandments. The brother of Jesus is the one speaking. This is 30 years after Jesus went back. And he's saying, if you break one, you've broken all. Then he quotes two to let us know what he's referring to. He's referring to the tent. Clearly then, in the days of James, James did not believe that the new covenant rendered God's law null, obsolete, and void. Let us go to Romans. The mighty, mighty apostle. The most powerful teacher after Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul. Romans 13, reading from verse 8. Our subject, question and answers. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, honor thy father, thy mother. Paul quotes from the Ten Commandments. And he ends that verse, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, which is a summary statement of the last six commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, a summary statement of the first four. Paul clearly did not believe that the new covenant canceled, made null and obsolete the law of God. James didn't believe it. And I said, you cancel the commandments, you cancel the judgment. Let's go back to James chapter 2, and we'll fin finish off tonight's questions and answers. James 2, read verse 12. After saying in verse 11, he that said, do not, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Listen to a warning in verse 12. James says, so speak ye, and so do, as what? Come on, loudly. So speak ye, and so do, as what? They that shall be what? Judged by what? The law, he calls it the royal law in verse 8. He calls it the, the law of liberty in verse 8. He called uh, the law of liberty in verse uh, 12. The royal law in uh, verse 8. The Ten Commandments. James says, live your life. As if you realize that one day you'll be judged by the standard in God's law. Now, if the new covenant has made God's law, and I keep using these words, null, obsolete, and void, where's the judgment? Listen to the wisest man who ever lived. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Go there with me quickly, then we pray. We're closing off questions and answers. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. And keep praying. I don't want the devil to put the wrong word in my mouth in the last five minutes and ruin everything. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Read the next few words. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or bad or evil. The Ten Commandments of God, which represent the whole duty of man, will be the standard by which men and women are judged in the judgment. If you say the new covenant has made God's law null, void, and obsolete, then you tell me how will God conduct a judgment with no standard? My listening friends, the law of Moses does not refer to the Ten Commandments. It refers to the first five books of the Bible. Sometimes it's just called Moses 
as in Luke 24, 27, sometimes the law of Moses, Luke 24, verse 44. We found out from 1 Corinthians 9, 9, that the law of Moses said, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. We found out that is not in the Ten Commandments, so the law of Moses could not refer to the Ten Commandments. We found out that uh, in John 8, 5, now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned, the penalty for adultery. We found out the law does not give the penalty for adultery, the Ten Commandments. It is found in Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 24, 22, 21 to 24, and Leviticus 20, verse 10. The law of Moses is a reference to the first five books. We must study the Bible in context. And the very first verse, uh, which was brought to me, Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until Moses, refers to simply the writings of the Old Testament, which were the primary source of information until John came and presented it in a way that seemed different to them. Because when Jesus preached, the people said, we've never heard this. But it was in the Old Testament all along. But they said, we've never heard it because he presented it differently. And if you leave Luke 16, 16, where presumably the law has been ended, verse 17 says, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Christ cannot say in verse 16, the law ended with John, and then say in verse 17, heaven and earth will pass away first before the smallest portion of that law can end. We must reason through the scriptures. We must ask the Spirit of God to guide us. And let me tell you why the law is such a problem. Romans 8, verse 7, you don't need to go this, listen. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed. We are born with a fundamental opposition to God's law. Let me say it again. We are born with a genetic opposition to God's law. That's why you have to be converted, not improved converted because we that's why god's very first promise genesis 3 15 and i will put enmity between thee and the woman because no sinner will put enmity in his or her heart for the law of god god has to put enmity in that person's heart for sin we are born that way and so we find ourselves naturally opposing the law of God. But the law of God is a law of love. The angels keep it. Psalm 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of the Lord. If the new covenant canceled the law, what do the angels keep? My listening friends, study the Bible very carefully. Go to it to find out what it wants to say to you. Don't go to it to find evidence to establish what you believe. Go and let the word speak to you. The law of God, the Ten Commandments of God, are still in force and will remain forever because in Isaiah 66, 23, the Bible says, it shall come to pass, referring to the new world, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. This is a reference to the new world. Ask God to put into your heart and mind a love for that standard of righteousness. Because Jesus said, who initiated the new covenant, he who validated it, I should say, he said, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And when Jesus Christ is in the heart, the number one impulse is obedience. How many of you will say, Father, Give me a love for your law of love. Can I see your hand? Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this session. I've done my best as a human being, a weak effort, Father, but I pray that your spirit will go behind me today, God, and magnify what I try to say. Make it clear, because you love everyone listening to God, and you're not willing that any should perish. Give us a love for right doing. Let us say like David, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Hear this humble prayer, Father. Bring us back tomorrow night, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Good night, everyone. Drive safely. Come back tomorrow. We have Thursday, Friday, and we end on Sabbath. Three days left. May the Lord be with you and your family as you sleep tonight.